Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. I'm here with Rob and John, and they are from the Royal Navy Beachhead Commando Reenactors. And we're going to have a little chat with the guys and find out what they do and why they do it. So guys, tell me who you are, what you're portraying, and why you're doing it. So we are uh, Royal Navy Beachhead Commando Reenactors. Um, not to be mistaken with Royal Marine Commandos. Uh, although uh, we do wear the green berets and the Fairburn fighting knives, um, you'll notice that most of us actually wear naval caps. Um, that is one of the most important aspects of what we do, mainly and simply because uh, the Royal Navy Beachhead Commandos, um, whenever a unit says that we were the first ashore at any beach landing, chances are it was because the Royal Navy Beachhead Commandos put them there. And uh, we, we, through many, many years of research, have come to realise that they have sort of been written out of the history books. And certainly when it comes to being represented at living history events like this, uh, we, uh, we tend to get a lot of attention for being sailors dressed in green. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of our most important sort of aspects of the group to be able to explain what these guys did during the Second World War between 1942 and 1945. John, I think you'd be the best person yeah. to explain. So they were they were established, it was very soon realised that the Royal, Navy, the Royal Navy were the best people to put amphibious landings on the beach. Um, they, they've got that empathy with tides and water flows and, and uh, hand, boat handling and what boats are capable of doing what at which stage of the tide. So they trained up uh, small units of 27 men into, into beach parties, they called them beach bricks, um, with a beach master, I'm a beach master, uh, Rob's my sub lieutenant, he's an assistant beach master, and the rest of the guys um, were there to signal and handle boats. Um, they very soon realised that, that was fine, they knew how to do that, but they weren't able to defend themselves adequately on, in, a, in a, a, a hostile environment. They weren't, although they had basic small arms training, they, they weren't aggressively defensive enough, if that, if that makes sense. So um, they pretty soon realised they needed to train them to fight and train them to work autonomously like a, like a commando unit would. Um, so why not just put them through the commando training, which they, they did. Once they were given the title of commando, they actually got a very good quality of volunteer. They were all volunteers out of ships and, and, and elsewhere in, in the senior service. It's worth mentioning as well that they were usually the sort of troublemakers or the, the guys who'd been bored. And so, for example, if you were a stoker, you'd spent your entire naval career in the engine room of a ship, and uh, you were often the chance to do something else a little bit more specialised, perhaps a little bit more exciting. Yeah, totally. And it was a good opportunity to take. And uh, initially that was very much the case that quite often the ships would offload their troublemakers because if they're good at fighting on shore, you think they'd be good at fighting on shore. But later on they realised they needed, actually, you can teach a thinker to fight, but it's very hard to teach a fighter to think. So they would, they would, they were looking for a, a, a better calibre. And once they'd, they'd given them the kudos of being commandos, they could uh, they could pick and choose from the volunteers. They had volunteers from all over the place. Um, often they were the officers were volunteer reservists that were brought up either under the Y scheme from from senior ratings or indeed uh, from from outside of the navy, trained up to be officers to manage men on land. But their their primary role is managing bringing the resources to shore that you need for a, for a beach assault. They're no, you know they're known as the beachhead commandos, um, and and they would land with the assault group. They would be the literally the first people onto the beach saying, "Yep, you can bring the rest of everybody else." With them would land um, probably other other commando army commandos, Royal Marine commandos. The terrestrial forces would turn their back on the sea and start looking to expand the beachhead inland. The navy commandos would turn their back on the land, look out to sea, and look to bring in the resources in a controlled and, and, and planned way that would allow that beachhead to expand, but they had to be able to do that under under fire. So they'd be taking out uh, you know, nearby bunkers, sniper fire, mortar pits, anything that was stopping the beach master from doing their job. Those commando trained um, uh, sailors were doing that. They were also handling landing craft in the surf, small landing craft. You've got to be able to hold the ship's stern to sea, otherwise it's going to get in all sorts of trouble if it gets turned sideways. They'd be clearing beach obstacles, clearing mines, widening the front that you can bring the um, the rest of the assault group in on. They'd be receiving communications from the rest of the of the assault group as to what was needed, what beach was landed can be landed on and the beach master has that knowledge of the beach to say you might want a landing ship tank to land here but actually the water's only six feet deep and you need 11 to bring that in so he knew what to bring in and when he had signalers with him and he also had a beach signal group beach signal section with the main assault group and the army signal section they were also commando trained 
they, they, they all work together. So as, as everything expanded, so, so the, the, the operation from the, from the Navy side expanded. Um, and they would, they would have been doing everything from mine clearance with their feet underwater. We call it commando can-cans, but they were feeling for, for anti-tank mines with wow. their feet because you can't use a mine detector in the water. Um, they were trained to restart swamp vehicles. They, would, they, knew, they were trained on how to handle each landing craft, how to hold it in the surf. Where you could push it with a, with a, um, uh, you know, a, another vehicle, a you know, barb, uh, how to get it off if it got stuck. Because if you push a landing craft in the wrong place, the door will never open again. All of that sort of stuff. Trying to hold stuff and hold their nerve under fire. You know, it's I think all... it's one of the main focuses as well. Going back to what we were saying about how different it is to see Royal Navy sailors dressed in green. Um, and as John said earlier on, it's far easier to teach someone who already has a very, very, very detailed working understanding of how to handle ships and, and machinery at sea and to understand tides and things like that. It's much easier to teach someone who has all of that basic knowledge um, and experience as well up to a certain extent how to fight than it is someone who's very ex experienced in fighting how to handle landing craft and vessels. And these guys did literally everything. They, they had to be multi-skilled in terms of... You know, their experiences with signalling aboard ships was completely invaluable for a beach landing of such massive scale. Um, they also had to be fairly mechanically minded to be able to shift vehicles off the beaches if they started creating bottlenecks. Um, they had to be fit, ready to go, and pretty much sort of everything you could possibly imagine, all while under fire from the enemy. And it was very much, uh, you know, they were they were there to support the Beachmaster and the, the clues in the name Beachmaster, he was, and I, you know, generally the Beachmasters were only lieutenants, sub-lieutenants, you might see the odd uh, lieutenant commander, but they were junior naval ranks um, and they they had absolute authority on their beach. So they, because they understood the bigger picture of, of what had to be moved when and, and the problems if you didn't get something off your beach in time, they could, they, the, there's a count of them actually telling a full-blown colonel with a column of tanks that he will wait while that infantry and soft-skinned vehicles get off get off the beach. You know, you, your average beach may be a mile long, but it probably has one or two places where you can get vehicles off. And if that gets blocked or something gets stuck while the tide comes in, you're going to be in a world of problems. So he had, they had the authority to say stop. Right, and they carry that authority very well. The Americans had a, a beach master. Um, system going but for some reason the American beach master system didn't work quite so well so, so so much so that by the time it got to the Japanese mainland landings they were talking about using British beach masters and the Royal Navy commandos yeah. to run American beaches right. we'd already interacted with them in places like Omaha you know mm. you had the Royal Navy landing American troops on Omaha Beach so they understood the way the way the British worked and I don't know whether it was some kind of hangover from colonial authority that they, they you know, a, a plummy British accent saying, wait there, move there, get that there. Maybe it worked, but it, it, they, they, they seemed to embrace that. And, and, you know, we were all working together by the time it came to Japan anyway. So, so I mean, I, I, I suppose the most famous uh, portrayal of a Beachmaster is Kenneth Moore in Longest Day, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I really wondered was, how long would a Beachmaster be running that beach for? Because obviously, D-Day, yes, that's the first day everyone's landing, but you know, there'd still be things coming ashore for, for days, weeks? Absolutely, and, and generally, if it was a beach they were coming in on, mm. there would be a Beachmaster there. Um, and uh, But really, once, once the, they got a nearby port open, then the Beachmaster and, and his commandos could withdraw. They... Uh, I think there were examples later on where the beaches were so secure and the, the routine was so well set that the, 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 these guys could withdraw and it was handed over to, to more regular Navy units to run it. But generally, um, all the time the beach landing was ongoing, the beach master and, and the commandos would be there. Uh, and uh, you know, some of them were massive with several several commando units and some of them were literally you know uh, each commando uh, group was broken into three sections so we re normally we represent n commando that were in sicily and italy and there was n1 n2 n3 and they could be uh, they could be spread out into different beaches different areas even different sides of the country at certain times right um, but uh, on other occasions you would have had several commando units running, you know, Dido would be classic, you, you know, you've got different commandos running different beaches and sectors of beaches, and they may be there for a long time, but I think the, the, the plan was really once they were, weren't needed, then get the commandos out and use those skills on the next landing, 
uh, and indeed they leapfrog through you know, North Africa, the, the insertions of, of usually of supplies to support the, the Allied advance in North Africa and leapfrogged up the Italian coast and they, they diversified quite a lot. I mean in Italy they were used for uh, marshland crossings, they had Navy Commander driving buffalo amphibious vehicles uh, for the Americans because they had that nautical knowledge um, and they were used for crossings of the Shell Dashery, um, Valkyrian Island, sort of around there and then uh, you know as we said they were even embarked at Croatia and, and going over towards Japan ready for the bomb. Fortunately the bombs were dropped, I don't know, it depends on your outlook, but anyway, two very big bombs were dropped in Japan and they weren't required for the big landing from the Japanese mainland. Very um, rapidly ended the party. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean there's, there's only a couple of, couple of thousand of them really trained up, they're not well known and we, you know, I kind of stumbled on it from looking at Navy beach parties and I was, you know, when I was starting out in reenactment and um, it fascinated me that these guys existed and, you know, I always thought that, you know, Marines were commandos and commandos were Marines, but then you discover that, you know, Churchill wanted to commando units in all the services. He was the great driver of the, of the, the, the concept of the commando from his experience, I think, in the Boer War. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you see so you had these sailors who were, you know, blue hats and, and uh, green berries at the same time, where one or the other, depending on who you're talking to. There's a, there's a very famous comment, just to, to, to sort of finish up on that, um, they were so proud of the fact that they were sort of volunteered out of the Navy, that during their commando pass-out parades, they'd be handed their Fairburn Sykes fighting knives, so thank you very much, that's very good, stuff it in their pockets, and then of course the famous commando green beret would be passed to them, and instead of putting it on their heads and wearing it very proudly, they'd scrunch it up, put that back in their pocket, put their navy caps back on and just generally sort of lord it over everyone else there that they were senior service royal naval service but then and when they, they went back to their <laughs> units you know they they they'd be in front of other sailors put on the green, green beret, beret. On. you might you might be a sailor but i'm a commando <laughs> sailor so yeah well thanks very much guys All really good. appreciate it thank you absolute pleasure Cheers. another really interesting element of the group's display was a pair of mark one star star canoes which were used by cop the combined operations pilotage parties to survey beaches before landings. Jack, who had restored the canoes, very kindly took me out for a paddle in one, which was a fantastic experience. You can hear a chat with Jack about COP and the canoes on a recent episode of our Fighting on Film podcast. Thank you again to the Royal Navy Beachhead Commando Reenactment Group, for taking the time to chat with me, and of course to Jack for the canoe joyride. Thanks to the organisers of We Have Ways Fest, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Please consider supporting the project via Patreon, or simply share the videos with friends. It all helps. Thanks again for watching, catch you next time.